Antarctica. 13 million square kilometers of snow and ice, and the setting for an extraordinary challenge. It's ridiculous that a place like this should exist. Led by expedition patron Prince Harry. I'm honored and privileged to be here with these guys. Four wounded British soldiers. There's not a single person doing this that isn't feeling knackered, sore to the core. Are taking on teams from the Commonwealth and America. This has been the toughest thing I've done since I've been blind. To race over 200 kilometers to the South Pole. I think he's just completely lost it. I got frozen hands. It's a journey that will challenge the wounded. Easy, you're gonna feel very dizzy. Oh. And the non-wounded alike. It just feels as though it's getting worse and worse. Antarctica jumped up, bit me in the ass. As it becomes a struggle for survival. We are simply not gonna do it. And that means we've failed. In the coldest, windiest, and driest place on Earth. At one o'clock, the teams head out into the freezing wilderness. Team UK in red take an early lead. Close on their heels, the Commonwealth in orange, followed by Team USA in blue. 12 amazing people have managed to pull themselves through you know, a year's worth of training um, to get to the South Pole, and I think that is a huge achievement. They're hoping their race will inspire their fellow wounded. For some of them, lying in a hospital bed, being told you may never walk again, or you're going to be restricted in, in, for the rest of your life. Hopefully, they can associate themselves in some shape or form with someone in one of those teams and go, well, if they can do it, I can do anything. And that's the point. That is the point of this, of this, of this whole adventure, in my mind. All four of the British team are amputees. Captain Ibi Ali's arm was severed by a roadside bomb. Major Kate Philp lost her leg to an IED. Captain Guy Disney's leg was destroyed by a rocket-propelled grenade. And Sergeant Duncan Slater lost both legs when his vehicle was blown up. Already, pulling 80 kilo sleds is testing fragile, rebuilt bodies. The ground underfoot is a sea of sastrugi, frozen waves of unforgiving ice. Everyone's learning the hard way. If you screw up out here, you get punished. 3,000 meters above sea level on the Antarctic plateau, high altitude saps even the strongest. There ain't much oxygen up here to suck in. Every breath, you have to take another one. They've traveled 16,000 kilometers to be here. The next 200 will be by far the greater journey. We've got a very narrow advantage. They keep pushing that out at the moment. The polar routine is two hours racing, followed by 10 minutes break for nine hours a day. Well, we're going at a steady 3.3 kilometers per hour. Each team has a polar guide for the Brits it's Conrad Dickinson. At the moment, we're in the lead, so I'm quite pleased with the team. At the first break, the team takes stock. In the punishing cold, double amputee Duncan has to take extra care. Old Stumpy's getting a bit sweaty, so I'm going to dry him off, because if I was to like that, stay as it was, it freeze, and that's not a good day. At one point, you're out in Afghan on ops. The next day, you're in hospital in a lot of pain. Duncan was blown up in 2009. 12 months later, both his lower legs were removed. It takes a long time to, to get over that one. You've got to kind of find out who you are again and, um, you know, what makes you tick. Hey, there they are. 
Kate is struggling with the altitude. Legs fine, it's just, it's just like having a handbrake on me. OK. <laughs> Kate's vehicle was hit by an IED in 2008. She chose to have what was left of her shattered leg removed. When I take my prosthetic off and I, and I look at my stump, it's so much more normal now than it, than it was. There are times where I've looked at it and inspected it quite closely and thought, yeah, gosh, what a funny looking thing it is or whatever. But I think you can become quite objective about it. What's the distance, Conrad? Doing that now. Guy lost his right leg in Afghanistan in 2009. There are things that I won't be able to do now. You know, my soldiering career is now over, which is tough. He left the army earlier this year, but not before serving a second tour as an amputee. I'm a strong believer in you just get on with life, and I really, I was very conscious of making that decision when I was injured. The altitude is getting to Ibi as well. All right, Hibs. Just a bit sort of breathless and exhausted, really. Ibi's right arm was severed when his Land Rover was blown up in Iraq in 2007. Since then, he's become a dad to Zara. She very much puts a smile on my face, even just thinking about her. And she's grown up with me having the amputation, so she knows no different. She will go and tell anyone that Daddy's only got one arm. My dad is a soldier, and, and he got blown up in Iraq. OK, let's go. The brakes are vital for refueling. But in the brutal cold, Canadian Chris Downey is finding it hard. A bomb disposal expert, Chris suffered multiple injuries when he was blown up in Afghanistan, including the loss of an eye. A bit chilly. Fingers are frozen. The team lose valuable time waiting for Chris. The Commonwealth slipped down to last place, pulling Chris's sled for him. But even without it, Chris is deteriorating. He's gone on the head on his own. I think he's just completely lost it. Supporting the Commonwealth team is Simon Daglish, one of the charity co-founders. Chris, how are you? I got frozen hands. Let's have a look. I'll be OK. I'll be seeing. Let's have a look, mate. Trying to send me back to yeah. the wind. Is it warm? Yeah, they're fine. They're fine. They're fine. Just getting back in there. They're fine, mate. Right, what you'll do is just eat in the brakes, it's so important. I think your energy's low, mate. Just eat, eat, eat. Even if it's cold, get it out of the bag and get it in your mouth. At the end of the day, the teams pitch camp, 14 kilometres closer to the pole. The first priority is to warm up. Absolutely drained at the moment. It's been a bit of a baptism of fire, but we've made up some good ground and, uh, yeah, a bit of an eye opener. It is horrendous. But as we all know, day one and day two is normally pretty tough. With day three and day four, hopefully we'll get into it. And then when we're at day five, we could potentially be halfway through. I am exhausted. I think, you know, the guys, they'll probably be a bit down, but they shouldn't be. We, we smashed it. Status. Just status. Winning. Winning. Yeah, that's a good one. We'll have that. Team condition. 
<laughs> Fragile. <laughs> We've got some tired teddy bears. But yeah, pretty good, pretty pleased. This was run. I managed to catch it just before it froze. <laughs> it's really rank. It's horrible. As the second race day begins, spirits are high. And you're right, my beard is ginger. <laughs> he was trying to say, do you think it's blonde? I go, no. This is not grey. Uh, hey, come on, steady man. <laughs> Canadian Chris Downey seems back on form. I'm good now. <laughs> Doesn't like making yourself feel like an ass on day one. Let's go. As they set off, Team UK have the lead, with the US second and the Commonwealth team lying third. Cells warm, fellas. Navigating the sharp ridges of uneven ice is particularly challenging for blind American Ivan Castro. Right to go off a lift. On it now. Ivan lost his sight in a mortar attack in Afghanistan. This is like being back at war. The terrain is your enemy. And it's a battle. We're fighting each step of the way. It's a battle that some of the Commonwealth team are losing. Expedition doctor Dan Royce Dessar has an emergency call out. Uh, it seems that Chris is, has collapsed. After struggling on day one, Chris Down is now in serious trouble. Less than two days into the South Pole race, and Antarctica claims its first victim. Expedition doctor Dan Royce Dessar has been called out to Canadian Chris Downey. So what came first, the, the dizziness and the collapse or the shortness of breath? Nothing, just the, the first thing you know is you're on the floor. Chris's teammate, Australian Seamus Donahue, was first on the scene. I turned around and he was in the snow and he was completely out. So he was uh, unresponsive, passed out. Easy, you're going to feel very dizzy. Mm. He's complaining of, of, of chest pain and breathing discomfort. What I want to do is spend at least the next 24 hours checking him over, making sure that he's absolutely OK, as if not, he's staying with us with the vehicles. <coughs> Chris is taken back to the expedition base camp. His team ski on, two hours behind and one man down. It's like letting your team down. It's pretty miserable. Being weak in front of them, that sucks. Slowing them down, that sucks. <laughs> but all does it. The British are maintaining their lead. As they race, even in the cold, it's all too easy to overheat. You want to be comfortable. You should never be warm. You should be comfortable. As the second day ends, Team UK is nearly two kilometers in front of the Americans and more than five kilometers ahead of the Commonwealth team. But the British lead has come at a price. It's Ari! Ari, Ari! Ari Herxon is expedition paramedic. Have you pain in this? Uh, it's just numb and swollen. Yeah. Um, Antarctica's unrelenting cold has caught Kate out. She has frostbite. The problem is, I'm getting quite hot. And so for 
part of the day I didn't have my ears covered when we stopped. And I just said to Libby, my ear look all right. And he's like, no. <laughs> if Kate's frostbite worsens, she could lose part of her ear and her place in the race. It's been a hard day for everybody, but I think the thing to remember is it gets better. The body adapts, the sledges get lighter, the snow levels off a bit, and that's what will happen. As Team UK wake to another bitter Antarctic morning, 170 kilometers still lie between them and the pole. Good morning, day three. Um, Union Jack is flying high. Where is she? There he is through there. Nice little touch that. Where's our fearless leader? There he is. Yay! He's smiling now, but he was spooning me about four hours ago. <laughs> it is only day three, and it's starting to hurt. There's not a single person doing this that isn't feeling knackered, sore to the core. It's just how you get on with it. That's really the, the test now. You know, I got in the tent yesterday and I was like an old man. I was in a lot of pain, like stumps are swollen. I was in rag like her, but you're going to be in rag after nine hours skiing like her. Our one solace is listening to our iPods. Everybody's iPods crashed because of the cold. When there's nothing in your head, which there is in mine. It's a lonely old place to be, I tell you. Conrad is not happy. The team is slow getting going. We agreed last night we were going to start at 9 o'clock. When you have a football match that kicks off at 3 o'clock, you don't have a football player shuffling on at quarter past 3, saying, sorry, I'm late. Yes, it's cold. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, we're under the weather. But you've got to lift yourself into a positive spiral. Otherwise, we will fail. Despite the late start, Team UK have kept their lead, closely followed by the Americans. The Commonwealth team have ground to make up, but are motoring along. But as the day progresses, exhaustion kicks in. The final rest break comes none too soon for Kate. I just feel like I'm going to kill over any minute. No, oh, you won't. You won't. Yeah. Yeah. Have some. Wait, I can't. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you. One man down, the Commonwealth team has closed on the Americans, but at a cost. It's not just the wounded suffering in the arduous conditions. Despite 20 years' experience, Australian polar guide Eric Phillips has been hit hard. How's the day been? Ah, terrible. I can't get breath. I can't get breath. And you know, I'm feeling the pain. <laughs> <laughs> As the day ends, the tents are a much needed refuge. I'd say that the priority tonight is eat as much as you can. Hydrate as much as you can and get your head down as quick as you can. Yeah. Try to get the body rested and tomorrow's another day. It takes over two hours to melt snow, to drink and rehydrate their rations. Kebab casserole, two nights running. Luckily it's good. Pasta and tomato. That's New a one. really good one. New one. It's a delicious one. That actually tops uh, spaghetti bolognese. Oh, smell that. Can you smell that? Smell it. 
Mmm, yum, 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 yum. Even for able-bodied Harry, it's been a tough three days. So day one, I got a hot spot. Day two, I just let it manifest into a blister. Whatever it was is now popped to there and something else there as well. And what's really weird is I can't begin to describe to you how sore that is. <laughs> but it's, you can't even see it. But, um, yeah, count myself lucky that I've got feet. Three kilometres behind Team UK, Canadian Chris Downey is rejoining his team. He's been given the all-clear by the doc, but his polar guide, Eric, hasn't. Do you feel short of breath just sat there? Yeah. <laughs> Eric has fluid on his lungs, a sign of serious altitude sickness. A killer. You just have to see how you actually respond to the treatment. But you can't carry on like that day after day after day. You know it. You know it. Um, <clears throat> that, could, that, could, that could have you very ill very, very quickly. For now, Eric's race is over. The doc's medical rounds continue with the Brits. Coping well with that, aren't you? Yeah, it's good. Good. She's done. You could die with some sort of cold weather injury here. She's <laughs> mad. Reduced circulation and muscle mass make their stumps especially vulnerable to cold weather injuries. The only bit on here is the usual. Oh, you've got that, head. That's the usual bit that yeah, the problem. Which is just started. Kate's stump is sore, the but her frostbitten ear is the bigger worry. I think you've, you, you, you've got some damage. You may have some damage to the cartilage of your ear there, and so you're not going to get away completely scot free. But if I can keep it covered like I did today, there are no guarantees. You are in the middle of nowhere. Um, I need to dress it anyway. Yeah. The, the treatment's the same, but we've got to be. We've got to be very clear about this, okay? Because of because of where it is, I don't want you to get any cos any sort of ongoing cosmetic damage there, Kate. I really don't. Okay. So what's the worst case? Um, damage to the ear, to, to damage to the cartilage of the ear, and, 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 and is it and, just cosmetic, or would it affect? No, 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 it won't hearing, affect you. It won't, it won't affect hearing, but it will give you like a cauliflower. Keep my hair long, I feel right. It will give you like a cauliflower. Okay. But it's a decision that you've got to. I think um, you've got to decide on. I'm afraid. I think we, we carry on, and I just keep it covered like I did today. Okay, we'll dress it for you. Yeah. All right. If it gets any worse, it will be the end of the race for Kate. At the bottom of the world, three teams of wounded are battling each other and the Antarctic to reach the South Pole. Race status. Team UK, first place. Everyone's looking good in front. All pretty tight. Second place, USA. And quickly catching up is the Commonwealth team. Canadian Chris Downey seems to be back on form but his team guide, Eric Phillips, remains out of the race. In Team UK, despite a blistered stump and a frostbitten ear, Kate still ski. You know, to be fair, with the frostbite that she had, that was an easy way out that anyone could have taken this morning. And she's still with us, so fair play. Duncan's up front, double amputee. Leading the way, pushing on with a really nice pace. Such a privilege to be here. You know, you tread in, in the footsteps of a lot of people that have been here before. They've uh, explorers and all the rest of it. I'll say this, if uh, you haven't got the chance to come here, you've got to grab it. It's a beautiful place. I love it. You have to come to the South Pole to get away from it all, clear the mind, and just enjoy the space. And then find myself with a camera strapped to my chest. It's not intrusive. It's not intrusive at all. Day four. 
should be the day when everyone finds their polar ribbon. But Antarctica is pitiless. Its cold, dry air burns the lungs. Kate has been suffering since the race began, as has Richard Eyre, UK team mentor. It's still pretty terrible. I can't breathe. New Kate, how are you? <coughs> Coughing and spluttering. <coughs> Breathing's been a lot worse today. Take a deep breath on me. And again, some muck developing down there. Deep in. Dr. Dan wants both Brits in the medical tent for treatment. It's not only Kate's cough and ear that are causing concern. Her stump, rubbed sore, has become infected. I've got a, this pussing on that fibula head. Should I just leave it off? Yeah, yeah I'll just help you in the car. We can't leave her overnight in a tent miles away from where we are. It's much, much safer and we can at least make her much more comfortable. Take it for the moment, the race is off for those two. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you feel like you've prepared physically and mentally and you had some you know, excellent training. And I'm used to meeting tough challenges, you know, in my job. And uh, I think that's why it's so disappointing, because, you know, I've, I've done all right up until now. <laughs> The next day, and the team ski on, minus three of their fellow racers. They're half a day from the first checkpoint, where they'll all have a much needed 24 hour enforced rest. The British team remains in the lead, but the Americans have dropped back to last place. Blind soldier Ivan struggling to breathe. This morning I started skiing and I couldn't breathe. And I thought that um, that after 10 minutes it would go away, but the harder I pushed myself, <clears throat> the less I could breathe. I felt like I had an elephant sitting on my chest. Just six miles before the checkpoint, Ivan's pulled out too. It's kind of tough because, you know, I never quitted anything in my life, but it's, it's the fact, it's, it's truth. And I'm slowing down a team. And if I slow down a team, they're going to get cold. At 10.54, a depleted Team UK arrive at the checkpoint first. Hey, hey. <laughs> finish line. <laughs> Far from the finish line, isn't it? Jubilant because we're the first team here. You know, that's the third of it done now. The team pulls the puddings out, your people no legs. Single legs, fantastic. Guy and Duncan, <laughs> remarkable. Those two just led us the whole way in. Glad to be here. Uh, okay. Pretty for a rest now, like. Without Kate and Richard, the lead is bittersweet. It's good, but I, the only thing I say is I, I can't help feeling a bit of a failure not getting everyone here. And to have not got them here, I can't help but feel we've let them down. Hey, British team's still here, still flying the flag. 90 minutes on, Team Commonwealth arrive. Their guide, Eric's, recovered enough to cheer them in. An hour later, Team USA make it, one man down. Just wish I was out there with him, coming in with him, and not, not standing there waiting for him. But I'm happy to see that they're coming in. <laughs> well done, Therese. You made it. Thank you. Well done. I'm not even third away there. <laughs> Altitude, frostbite, and exhaustion have taken out members of every team. Oh. 
Antarctica has been ruthless, and something has to change. Race organizer Ed Parker calls an emergency meeting with the guides. The responsibility of every person on the plateau lies on my shoulders. And right now, I can promise you, my shoulders have been sagging. Right at the beginning of this, our aim was to get 12 wounded individuals onto the pole. If we go on like this, we are simply not going to do it. And that means we've failed. Ed gathers all the teams together. He has an announcement to make. I've decided the race is over. And from here on in, we're doing this together. We're going to get 12 people who are here having been wounded onto the pole. And in seven or eight days' time, we're going to be standing there together. It's a massive game changer. It's a bit disappointing we're not doing the whole distance, if I'm quite honest, because we've trained for it, prepared for it, and uh, we're in good shape for it. But Ned's absolutely right. Ed's plan is to unite the teams and slow the pace to get everyone to the pole together. I think absolutely right decision to make. There's some people in a pretty bad clip at the moment. I think if we kept on pushing the way we were going, I'm sure something fairly similar would have happened to us. The whole point of this, of this expedition was to prove to people back home who are lying on their, on, on their beds in hospital or, or at home, the impossible is possible. I, would, I don't want to get to the South Pole and if I'm standing next to all of these guys and girls, there's no point, that's not what I came for. Who's that? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> surprise! Surprise, surprise. How are you, Harry? Are you OK? I'm good. Oh, it's foot and hand inspection time, I'm afraid. Foot and hand inspection time. <laughs> George is at the job. The 24 hour rest is a chance for the doc to give everyone a once over. I couldn't pop it. Good. You've got no problems there. Fantastic. And I've had no problems whatsoever with the stump. Good. And, again for me. and for the doc to be checked out too. Oh. <sighs> Sorry about the cold. Once more. It's cold. <laughs> once more. <laughs> You're mad. You're mad. But in Kate's tent, things aren't so good. That's taking some skin off. OK, let's get another dressing on that, then, and get that clean. Is that, that's, is that the major bit that's causing you the pain when you put your prosthetic on? Yeah, I mean, that's always the problem around the fib infected, But there's obviously some weeping coming from it. I just took the opportunity in the, t in the tent today, whilst I was on my own, just to do a bit of, sort of <laughs> soul-searching, if you like. I feel like a real burden on the team, and, I, you know, I'm literally not pulling my weight, and I'm, you know, not, um, not contributing, and I'm not myself. It's a real hard one to, to deal with, but, hey, you know, no-one ever says it's going to be easy, and it's, it's a challenge, and it's, it, it's pushed me in different ways than I expected, so... But that's probably a good thing. A lot of these guys and girls have done heroic things, but then, you know, they're not heroes. They're normal people trying to get their lives back on track. You can't tell someone how to get over losing a leg. You can't tell someone how to get over PTSD. It's, it's just simply not possible. So I hope that if they haven't come to terms with, with their injuries and stuff, then maybe this is the best place for it. I'm obviously here for these guys, I'm here for the charity, but there's obviously there's a little part of me that is, I'm, I'm able to use it in my, for my own advantage, you know, being away from it all, um, having some head, head space, having some time to think about stuff, and I don't know, it's just not having to worry about stuff and not being, being un, uncontactable, which is great. The next day, teams, no longer in competition, set off for the pole together. The race may be over, but the challenge remains huge. They're still 110 kilometers from the pole and a long way from safety. On the ice, conditions remain punishing. We just had a call to say that Alex has fallen over. 
apparently his speech is slurred and he's not got very much sensation down one side of his body. Alexandre Baudin d'Anjou is a Canadian combat engineer. What happened? I was skiing and then I can't feel my left side now. Alex survived two explosions in Afghanistan. Now Antarctica has brought him down. Two, three. He says he's lost feeling down one side of his body. He's not speaking all that clearly. So the safest thing for us to do is get him in the vehicle, take him back to where we've got a tent. It happened to me before, but just my leg, not half my body. So it was uh, very scary at that moment. The thing I remember is thinking about my children, and I want to be able to play with my children again, so I don't want to s stuck like this. But... The race was stopped to make things safer, but Antarctica remains utterly unforgiving. And it's not long until there's another emergency call. He's had headaches for a number of days, but I gather it's got worse overnight. This time, it's Prince Harry. Skiing to the South Pole has been punishing. It's taken a toll on the wounded and the able-bodied alike. And on day eight, it's Prince Harry who's gone down. Tell me, tell me what's been happening. Um, I slept for about an hour. Um, and just I've... describe the headache to me at the moment, please. It just feels as though it's expanding. It's just getting worse and worse. It's... Harry's fallen victim to the extreme environment. High altitude, dehydration and exhaustion have finally got to him. Antarctica jumped up, bit me in the ass. If you show weakness to Antarctica, I think it exploits it. Um, I think it will slowly um, grind you down until until you have that utmost respect for it, which I now have. Have you been vomiting or feeling sick with this? No. Can you feel me touching you down here? Mm-hmm. And here? Mm-hmm. And here? Mm-hmm. Oh! They thought I could come out here and just crack on and see it through without any issues, make sure that I'm here for the guys when they need me. But, um, yeah, I, I'm frustrated and, and disappointed in myself, but um, it really does prove quite how mentally and physically tough these guys are. For now, Harry's out of the challenge, too. The next morning, 80 kilometers from the pole, Prince Harry is itching to get back on the ice. Being tent-bound really sucks. If I can join the guys for the last couple of hours today, that'd be great. Um, I don't really enjoy sitting around doing nothing, especially when I know that they're walking 17 kilometers. After resting for 36 hours, Harry rejoins his team. Each day, the pole is 16 kilometers closer. One by one, all the race casualties return. First, Alex. And then, Kate. Is that something you're looking forward to? Yeah, I am, actually. I'm probably a little bit nervous, to be honest. Just hoping that, um, you know, I can keep up and not slow them down like I was before, so... But it'd be good to be back with them. After 12 days high on the Antarctic plateau, the end is in sight. Looks like the South Pole. It must be about 10 k away, but it looks a lot closer. And all of a sudden, my blood is nice and warm again. <laughs> The pole is just half a day away. Good morning. Um, it is the morning of Friday the 13th, which means it's South Pole Day. All the teams go through their morning routine 
for the last time. Feelings, uh, relief, I think, is probably the biggest one, not just for me, but for everybody. Um, but at the same time, I get the fact that some of these, some of these guys, it's been a, he a hellish two, three weeks. It's been harder than probably some of us like to admit, but it's been good. Um, for me, it's been an utter privilege to do it with Dunk. <sighs> the days when I felt a bit sore, a bit tired, I just look at that man and it's him powering on, and it's, yeah, it's amazing. Alongside me has been guys with no legs, no arms, and with the constant pain in the backs, the, the heads, the shoulders, the necks, and not a one murmur of complaint or self-pity. From day one, the old stumps have gone black and blue with a bit of bruising, a bit of swelling up. But we knew that was going to happen. That's par for the course. You can't walk over 200 kilometres and not get a bit of a swollen leg. Like, oh my god! <laughs> I thought we were going to lose Harry for a minute. I think I win the beard competition. Looking forward to having a final ski today, especially seeing as yesterday went well. Um, hope everyone else is feeling good. I'm sure they are. Just thinking of all those men and women that have served and been wounded or killed. And so, guys, if you're looking down on me, thank you very much for your help and inspiration. And um, thank you for your sacrifice. Cheers, guys. I kind of hope uh, that uh, as a charity, we've kind of given a a little bit back to these people who've given so much to us. Something that they can hold on to for really the rest of their lives. It's been quite a tough couple of weeks. It's been a little bit more jeopardy than I would have hoped for. These people I met started meeting in September last year. They are completely different individuals now to the ones we met. They've all grown and there are 12 people who leave Antarctica in a better place. There are people who've been walking here with shadows alongside them of people who've lost their lives. And that's, it's very hard to keep that there, and I just hope this is the moment they can look to their futures. We've got a double amputee, a blind person, people with <coughs> appalling burns, people with mental injury. And I hope people see these young men and women, and they're inspired to actually, out of their dark place, get up and move forward. For many of the wounded, it's the start of their, of their new period of their recovery, when they prove to themselves they can still do incredible feats, brilliantly. After 13 days, 200 kilometers and seven medical emergencies. All 12 wounded soldiers ski to the South Pole together. So well, every single, every single person, but especially you know those, those twelve guys and girls. Good job, really good job. Hey, oh. not coming. Yeah, I'm a mess. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. You're a great guy. From now on, you 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 always enjoy the cold. It's good. Yeah, very good. It's a nice to finally be here. It's a phenomenal experience, and one I find myself very lucky to have been a part of. Good job. It's just such a privilege to be here. And in regards to the fact that I've only skied half the distance, it's still absolutely incredible to be here. It really is. And I couldn't be here with a better bunch of people.
I think the achievement as a group is more important to me than anything else. We've managed to get our team to the South Pole through not just the actual terrain, but physical and psychological hurdles have, have been overcome. And, and we've gone through that as a team. What happened in Afghan to my legs, it didn't take my, my spirit. You know, I've needed help out here, but you still try. You know, you still give it your best shot when, when you can. And uh, I think that's what's important. So I guess that's the old me, you know? So yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully things are on the up. Look what happens when you, I mean, you know, when, when so many people come together, you can achieve pretty much anything. As Afghan and, and other conflicts cease, we've got to come together. We have to um, to ensure that these guys and girls, you know, succeed in, in every possible way they can in the lives that they that they choose to lead. I'm honoured and privileged to be here with these guys. It's been um, been very special. Thank <laughs> you.